One of the reasons I get close to horror, one of the reasons I stick my hands deep inside the entrails of the most terrifying works of art, is to attempt to master and understand my own fears. The most preoccupying overriding fear is, of course, death. Death, the inescapable, the immutable. We aren't very good at dealing with it, I don't think, simply because we don't get close enough to it. We block it out until we have to deal with it. Then, when we do have to deal with it, we don't want to, because we've been teaching ourselves our entire waking lives to ignore it. Horror, for me, is a way to touch death, to run my hands over a bony face, to examine my own hands then afterwards, and watch them dance still in front of my still-seeing eyes. Horror that dwells on mortality, existence, fragility, or the surreal nature of our own reality or psyche, this is the horror in particular that interests me. Horror that is interested in death interests me. It is a good thing that horror is very, very interested in death. I've been reading a lot of news articles recently where I see people richer than I would be in a thousand lifetimes, paying for life-lengthening treatments and new technologies. I see these people as trying to control something that is entirely out of their control. I see these people as powdering themselves. Patrick Bokanowski's 1972 film, The Woman Who Powders Herself, is an astounding work of existentialism. When I first saw this film, I saw much of myself in it, and saw much of where my own fears go. Watching it is like watching a dream. A dream from before I was born, and a strange dream at that. One of the most striking images from the film, of course, is the eponymous woman who powders herself sitting at a table, an adoring servant fawning over her eerie, one could even say grotesque, plaster mask that she is slathering makeup powder over. Yet at the other end of the table, a strange figure looms, an almost mocking reminder to the woman that, out of the corner of her eye, there is always the fragility of the shield she raises to protect herself, and the immutability of the idea of death. The film is itself in decay as you watch it. At the beginning it is hard to make out what is happening, but by the end it is even more difficult. The world exists in patches of light and darkness, seen in some instances only through strange shapes like mirrors, and glimpsing the truth is almost impossible. In medieval times, God was often seen as appearing in the small things. Julian of Norwich, an anchorite in 1300s England, lived much of her life in quiet contemplation. Yet she also lived it as an anchorite in an enclosed space. She entombed herself in a single room for most of her life. She desired to feel the pain of Christ, to know everything that he went through, physically and spiritually. And she did. She knew loneliness, isolation, and profound physical pain. The pain was so great that she herself wished for death. She says, The second came to my mind with contrition, freely desiring that sickness so heard as to death, that I might in that sickness all my rights of holy church, myself weaning that I should die, and that all creatures might suppose the same, say in me, for I would have no manner comfort of earthly life. I myself am not religious, but I see in Julian's actions and her own beliefs an intense understanding of herself, and her life was a brave one. She was perhaps the first woman to write in English, and she did so fighting against the upper crust of a society that would not have wanted her to do so. And in her words, her very important words, we see that death is something that she was freely desiring, not because she was suicidal but because she recognized that she had known all of the pain that there was to know, and she could hold on no longer. Fortunately for us, Julian survived these terrible pains and wrote more, lived longer. Yet in her words, in her experiences as an isolated figure, though an isolated figure with a maid, I saw a real happiness. God is something glimpsed through cracks in a wall or through gaps in the clouds. God is morning dew on the grass, or in the temperature of the ocean on a fine autumnal morning. Yet what do we do in the moments where God is absent? 
The film opens with a figure tossing clothes out of a large bin, while someone else proselytizes at them exaggeratedly. We search for meaning in every moment, every action we take, every bit of clothing we pick up, and then discard in disgust. The philosophy of existentialism is one that encourages us to ask for this meaning. The other side is about being fully aware of the choice of life, or in Yalom's term, being willing. According to Yalom, an individual wills himself into being what he is. Fundamental choices in life have to be based on responsibility. Being fully aware of one's existential situation means that one becomes aware of self-creation. The awareness of the fact that the individual himself is responsible for becoming who he really is, without any absolute, external, right answers, leads to the awareness of the personal fundamental groundlessness. This is the basis of the fear of ultimate freedom. Who decides whether a person's choices in life are the right ones? And the tough answer is, it, it is ourselves. Even as life rushes at us and we gain only fleeting moments of true perception, we must also make judgment calls regarding our own personal decisions. They might have social repercussions too, and others might impart their own judgments, but at the end of the day, it is ourselves we have to live with, always. To shut one's brain down is equivalent to the desire to live forever. It is a forgetting of what it is to be human, to have a responsibility to oneself and to others. The mask that covers the woman's face is just another shield. The figure that wanders through strange alien landscapes that can't possibly be anywhere on Earth, it seems, strikes me every time I watch the film. It is singularly haunting. Albert Camus' existential philosophy found his god in absurdity. Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill only to watch it roll back down, and for Sisyphus to follow dutifully after it. Yet absurdity need not be the only attitude we find emerging out of human suffering. To return to psychiatrist Irvin Yalom's writings, he writes that human suffering arises out of the givens of our human existence. The existential givens are the foundational human experiences and limitations that we have no choice but to be confronted by and will have to face as part of the structure of our existence. For Yalom, the four existential givens are death, freedom, isolation, and meaninglessness. He suggests that all of the human givens can give rise to suffering and emphasizes our ability to choose our attitude in relation to our suffering. Yalom's writings describe, for example, the ways in which we can confront our finite nature with a personal and positive attitude towards death. A personal attitude might enable us to turn towards our own death and find a way of dying meaningfully and with purpose. As such, the emphasis is placed on the attitude that one takes towards the foundations and limitations of human existence. It is this attitude that shapes both our experiences of the existential givens and the meanings we make out of our experience of them. I'm a fan of Yalom's writings because this attitude much reflects my own. This is also the attitude I see reflected in the woman who powders herself. The man, hungrily searching through the alien landscape which twists and turns around him, and he sometimes does a strange double take, searches for meaning. An enormous shrouded head looms out of the desert. It is singularly beautiful and intoxicating. Our life is a constant search for meaning. I don't believe that there is a quote-unquote tomorrow, a thing after death. So the search for meaning I am undergoing is one that has a ticking clock on it. If my consciousness or my energy does happen to survive my body's death, I know that it will not be the same. We make our own meaning, which is why art's subjectivity is so beautiful. I have read recently several shocking demands on a variety of online forums that decry the presence of critics. Someone even suggested that AI should replace critics and that somehow the audiences should be the only one who critique the artwork in question. This populist approach quashes individualism. It steamrolls personal interpretation. You know, my video essays are not intended to be de facto statements about a work of art's intention or about a piece of art's true meaning. I hope that what I have to say is interesting and that perhaps I can help shine a light on certain aspects of a work that maybe eluded you or interested you or that you needed someone else's words to explain or just provide you with a different perspective. But never, not once, do I want to erase your meaning. For people to even suggest popular interpretation, or more crudely, the score of a work of art should be the only thing expressed about it, it legitimately disgusts me. A revolting thought.
while hateful, prejudiced and or bigoted views that cause direct harm to others, especially those who are already painfully disenfranchised and vulnerable, should of course be shouted down and given no quarter whatsoever. To erase another's interpretation of art is, to my mind, an act of wretched destruction. To reflect on the woman who powders herself and other such works of majesty is to reflect on one's own life, and there is hardly a more important act than that. Frankel's philosophy of logotherapy further illuminates my own thoughts on the matter. Mark Boas explains, Logotherapy encourages clients to confront the actualities of their life and find meaning or change within it. As Frankel writes, everything can be taken away from a person, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given circumstances, to choose one's own way. To realize our capacity to choose an attitude toward our suffering is, in itself, an expression of human potential and existential meaning. We set our own paths. We find the meaning in the powdered face. We find the meaning in the chair raised above the head towards a cowering woman. We find the meaning in the house building itself slowly out of my own bones. I am coming to rest now the house says. In life, I am building my death house. Every second of every day, I hope I build it well. The woman who powders herself is an expose piece more than anything else to me. It is revelatory in how simply it shows the terrifying subject matter. Whether you interpret it as a judgmental society or a strange ritual, or just the minions of death reaching out to strike the woman down when her time has passed, does not matter. Despite her best efforts, we see the woman counting down on her fingers. Five, four, three, two, one. She hangs on to one. She is desperate for one. One more moment. Like the powder on her face, she wants the moment to be sealed forever in amber, to sluggishly embrace her for eternity. The moment lingers, painful, and I wish it could go on forever. I am rooting for her. Yet there she releases, and her head slumps down, her body rests still. You can't cheat death. I am rooting for death. It is that final, exquisite moment I wanted to talk about most of all, because I don't know about anyone else, but my best and most ready defense against the spectre of death is how far away death seems at any one time. I am still far away from it, I hope, and thus I can assure myself that to get close to death and horror is to get close to a mere fiction, a fantasy, at least for now. What this moment showed me in the woman who powders herself is that one day I will have to pass through that moment. One day I will clutch onto that moment like a rock in a storm and then it too will pass. It will pass. My rock will be dragged down into the ocean, and I will leave behind what flotsam I leave behind, whatever that may be. The act of immersing myself in horror is a way to powder my own face, to build my own shield. Whether or not it will work, I cannot say. I just know that I am immersing myself in what I love. I am talking about what I love. Horror is what I love. Writing and speaking these words are strange. The film evokes these deeply melancholy thoughts in me, but can there be any higher praise for a film or a work of art in general to say that it elucidated my thoughts on death, on the ultimate cessation of being? Stylistically, the film stands apart from almost anything else I've ever seen, bar perhaps the obvious Eraserhead comparison. But even that doesn't quite do it justice. It is a truly haunting, dreamlike experience, one that reminded me, every single moment of it, of daily rhythm and daily terror. I hope that this video essay, whatever it is, has convinced you to watch the short film. It is beautiful and sweetly frightening. It is the salve for my dread-induced wounds, for my broken hopefully brave, terribly uncertain heart. To you all listening, 
I say a profound thank you. To my patrons, Frank Aloons and Future Cityscape, I bow my head in gratitude for helping inspire me to keep making videos. To my family, I owe you everything. To my partner, I love you more than words can ever express. <laughs>